All right, this topic they gave me. This is a fun one because I could do anything with it. Libertarian culture wars is the topic. And that may sound like I'm going to spend all my time talking about um, internecine culture wars among libertarians. And since I hate to disappoint people, <laughs> I will say a little bit about that. But then I have a lot more to say about other things because we're engaged in culture wars, not just among ourselves, but in relation to the regime under which we live. And I'll have a lot to say about that as well. But I guess I do need to start with a little bit of this, but only a little bit, because I do, on an almost daily basis, uh, write an email newsletter. And a lot of times, when I just can't think of anything to write about, I think, what is the latest inanity going on in the libertarian world that, that needs to be corrected? Right? We need to if you, people join the Republican Party. They don't stop. They don't say, I, "I can't criticize the chairman of the Republican Party." They, you know, you, you join any group. You want that group to prosper. And sometimes the correction of errors is necessary for that group to prosper. Um, so what I recommend you do is on your smartphone. T believe it or not, if you text the word "snowflake." to the number 33444, you will get my book called Sane Space. See, see, it's a play on safe space, right? Except this is for libertarians. But my book Sane Space is an example of me kind of going after some people who need correction, that's all. We all need correction from time to time, nothing wrong with that. So text the word snowflake to 33444 and you'll get that. So anyway, I'm gonna say only a little bit about this here. What we believe in, and as when we talk about our view of society, I mean, abstracting from Austrian economics, but just thinking about our social philosophy, how society ought to function, the core bedrock of that is private property. And that helps keep our version of libertarianism grounded in something specific and concrete. And it is upon private property that the other features of civil civilization are based. So the international division of labor, for instance, economic calculation, and human cooperation itself. All these things have their foundation in private property. And private property helps us resolve a lot of disputed questions. Who is the owner of the property? So for example, the, the, old, the old saw about shouting fire in a crowded theater. Well, that's supposed to be an exception to the freedom of speech. We're told, of course, we can't be free speech absolutists. Why would you allow someone to shout fire in a crowded theater? And the person interrogating you in this way thinks, I got him. He doesn't favor shouting fire in a crowded theater. Doesn't that go to show that we can have wise regulation of the freedom of speech? If it's dangerous for you to be speaking against our troops during wartime, well, that's, it's just like shouting fire in a crowded theater, after all, isn't it? You wouldn't support that? All right. But you know what the answer to the old fire in a crowded theater question is? Private property. See how it resolves everything? Whose theater is it? The theater belongs to some guy. And that some guy probably has some terms on which you are permitted to use his theater. And one of them is, when you're here, don't shout fire if there ain't one. And you see, that resolves it. It's his property, his rule. Now there could be, maybe Walter Block would conceive of some crazy lunatic person theater where the object is to scare everybody for no reason and shout, and it's a positive virtue to shout fire in that theater. Maybe that would be up to that theater owner. Again, resolved, problem solved. Well, I happen to hear, uh, I don't want to mention names, none of the names matter, okay? None of the names matter. But I heard somebody not too long ago say, libertarians should not emphasize too much their opposition to anti-discrimination law because this will undermine our pro-LGBT position. You see, this, here's the problem, again. Instead of just conceiving things as matters of property, these people are thinking in terms of identity politics and that society is made up of a series of warring groups and we have to show that we also pander to each of these groups. That has nothing to do with what libertarianism is. At root, it's private property. 
and everything that follows from that. Whatever you want to do, you got your private property, you go ahead and do it, and that resolves it. Now, private property, when you believe in it strictly and absolutely, it can take you down some very radical roads. For example, if you believe strictly in private property, that means that some explorer from heaven knows where cannot show up on some continent, plant a flag in the ground and say, I hereby claim all the land as far as the eye can see for good king so-and-so. You can't do that. That's not how you acquire land. So that makes us seem like, oh, we must be on the left. But then on the other hand, we say private property also means no transaction occurs unless both parties consent to it because that's how civilized people interact with each other. They don't use other people as means to their ends. We view each other as ends in ourselves. And so that makes us seem very right-wing. And I just say, just another day in the life of a libertarian, right? Private property. I have this one I'd like to read to you before I leave this section of my remarks. This is a tweet. So you know this is going to be this going to be top notch this right here. This was from my Twitter feed from somebody calling himself a libertarian. And he says this is a person again I don't want to mention his name. I believe he's mentally ill. Um he has a habit of calling other libertarians Nazis, because that's a plausible thing to say, right? Doesn't sound like something somebody mentally ill would say. He says, he's speaking about my podcast, which I, I have the Tom Woods show, and he says, I was told you don't have people on your show who call you a Nazi. See, I have these crazy requirements <laughs> for the show. He says, let's make a deal. I retract the word Nazi. That's very generous, by the way. I'm the exact opposite, and he's going to retract that. Very good. And then, so that's what he does for me. That's the big fave. This guy with 12 followers is going to do that. And then what do I do in return? I give him access to my entire platform of many, 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 many thousands of people. He says, I'll retract the word Nazi, and you have me on to learn about why Watchdogging right-wing populism is so important for gender and sexual minority liberation. <laughs> and I said, you know what, I'm going to say no to that. I, I, I see no upside to this whatsoever. So that, to me, that, uh, I could spend my time just talking to you about that, but what would really, what would the point be, right? I don't, I don't think most libertarians are going down that particular road. I think the more important culture wars that we find ourselves engaged in are not, not with uh, oddball crazy people, but I, guess, I suppose a different brand of oddball crazy people, namely the regime under which we live. And the culture of this regime was laid bare to us under, with um, the passing of John McCain. Now, I'm not here to say terrible things about John McCain, but what I do want to do is observe what we can learn about the regime we live under based on what happened in the wake of his death. Here's what we read from um, probably future Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez. She said, and she's a, social, she's a uh, democratic socialist. This is what she tweeted out. John McCain's legacy represents an unparalleled example of human decency and American service. As an intern, I learned a lot about the power of humanity in government through his deep friendship with Senator Kennedy. He meant so much to so many. My prayers are with his family. Now, you may say to me, Woods, she had to say something. She has to acknowledge his passing, no doubt. But did she absolutely have to say John McCain represents an unparalleled example of human decency? Is that what happens automatically to you when you pass from this veil of tears? So I wonder about this. Here we have a democratic socialist, and yet she automatically knows exactly what the rituals of the regime are. That when one of its favorite sons passes, this is how you speak. Now, even if you thought McCain's war service was something to honor, then at least just go ahead and say that. But this language is bizarre and cultish, not normal. This is not the way normal people think. 
And so I thought this was an opportunity to reflect on the regime and the media culture in which we live. She's learned that the regime showers with preposterous honors those people who served the interests of the empire. And so no matter what enormities a normal moral reckoning would condemn someone for, he is to be canonized. And anyone like her who has ambitions within the regime had better join in the huzzas. I frankly am astonished that Trump somehow managed to refuse to be steamrolled into these creepy canonization rituals. I didn't think even he could resist. And there there was a CNN reporter standing there in the Oval Office, barking at him. Mr. President, are you going to say anything about John McCain? Mr. President? Mr. President, can you hear me? Mr. President? He just ignored him. This is bizarre. I can't believe somebody resists the regime. And this guy runs the regime. I, I don't... <laughs> One person. Now, I know we're supposed to respond. He's supposed to respond with platitudes. He's supposed to say, I deeply respect John McCain's life of public service and his commitment to human rights around the world. But you know what? I don't. I don't. I don't respect any of these people or their BS public service or their laughable so-called commitment to human rights. I don't believe a word of it. Now, I don't like to see anyone suffer, and I don't rejoice in that. But I'm not going to say some something that I would have to have a lobotomy to believe. And yet, we're taught to believe that what has happened now is that we've lost a maverick. The, the media all got the memo, you are to refer to this man to everyone as a maverick. And so they did, everywhere. All the news magazines on the cover, maverick, maverick, maverick. And I know I, I honor Ron Paul a lot, and you know maybe that's one of my big faults. You know how you go to a job interview and they say, what is your biggest fault? And you always give some ridiculous response. I work too hard. You know, you give like some fake <laughs> compliment to yourself. So I, because I, I don't think it actually is a negative thing to say nice things about Ron Paul. But think about a real maverick and then think about Ron Paul. They're the same thing, aren't they? Here's somebody who stood up to the entire establishment, not just its left wing version and the, all of its beloved institutions. Here's a man who cast the sole no vote in the House more than any other congressman. And in fact, more than all other congressmen combined. That's a maverick. He opposed the Federal Reserve when nobody else so much as mentioned it, much less criticized it. He stood up to the empire, the whole rotten system, not just one particular inter intervention somewhere. And he even got it through the thick heads of some conservatives that the bipartisan foreign policy consensus represented the very opposite of conservatism. So will our gatekeepers of approved opinion have such kind words for Ron Paul? The question answers itself. For these people, a genuine maverick is like a crucifix in front of Dracula. The very last thing the regime and its media want is a maverick, a true dissident, who asks the questions we are supposed to keep to ourselves. McCain loved the regime and the empire. At no time did he adopt a position that the New York Times or the Washington Post would consider a fundamental attack on the state, and that's why they loved him. He played by their rules. They were thrilled to call him a conservative. All the better to police opinion in America. Why, if you're conservative, why, we have this John McCain fellow for you. McCain's legacy lives on in every politician and journalist who jumps on every propaganda report to justify another round of bombing and intervention. It lives on in every politician who, after 15 years, after another idiotic intervention has occurred, finally admits it was a mistake never apologizing to the people he smeared at the time, who tried telling him it was a mistake, and who predicted every obvious consequence that any damn fool should have known. It lives on in a media that craves bipartisanship, but bipartisanship in the service of the state, and bipartisanship in which the left gets what it wants and the right gets a nice photo op. It lives on in the families who are missing children because of a war that McCain finally admitted had been a hideous mistake and a ludicrous expenditure of scarce resources. McCain was a man of the state in every fiber of his being, and that is why they cheer him. And that is why we, on the other hand, 
have to tell unpopular truths about McCain and about the, the empire he served. Now, I say these things because this shows how culturally radically different we are from the entire mainstream. They respond one way. We think the other. When we look at our heroes, we think about the things we might say about them and how we might honor them. And our heroes are scarcely to be acknowledged at all. Even though our heroes truly are fearless, they weren't going to get a favorable profile in the Washington Post. And yet they said, they spoke the truth. They said things that no one else would say for no reward other than the reward that comes from knowing you've done the right thing. How about the culture of the universities? We find ourselves in opposition to that because, well, half the time, we find ourselves uh, in uncomfortable positions on universities. Uh, some, some of our folks don't get promoted, they don't get hired, they get harassed, they get the terrible office in the corner with no window, they get screamed at when they appear on campuses, they get called all kinds of crazy names that make no sense. And meanwhile, the people in the universities doing these things portray themselves as dissenters. We are the resistance. We are the resistance. So these are the people who hold and push, for, push views that are held by the entire media, all of academia, all of the entertainment and cultural world, the intelligence agencies, and the deep state. This is hardly Guinness Book of World Records level courage going on before our eyes. You want to see real resistance? How about standing up against ideas that are relentlessly pushed by the media, the political classes, academia, and the culture, et cetera? Now, that's resistance. And as we've been seeing, all it takes is one high-profile figure saying no, and the foundation begins to totter. Now, Ron Paul was that example in politics. He stood there and refused to apologize when he was told by Rudy Giuliani why you can't say such a thing, I hope he'll apologize. Not only did he not apologize, he doubled down on what he said. Nobody does that in our society. We all know that. You stray from the three by five card of allowable opinion, you get called on it instantly and you are expected to go get the official 2018 version of the liturgical book of apology where you stand and say, I deeply regret what I said and how insensitive and hurtful it was. I deeply regret the pain I caused. And you say it, and then they come back with, it was very good of you to say that. And then it's a back and forth, it's a liturgical act. And we all know, we all expect it. Anybody goes off that three by five credit, we immediately expect the apology for having been truthful. We know that's going to come forward. It's an apology for being truthful. And he wouldn't do, he would not apologize for being truthful. And if you asked him unfashionable questions, uh, you asked him questions that any focus group would have told him, stay away from, change the subject, run away, he'd just give you the answer. Nope. I'm going to tell you that I don't believe in this, this, or this, even though by telling you this, I'm causing myself all kinds of avoidable grief I could have avoided if I just ran away from the question like everybody else does. But I refuse to do that. Now, I'm going to get back to him again in, in a moment. But within the university context, we've seen that one man, who simply says, no, I am not going along with the leftist cause of the day, and I won't be steamrolled into doing it. And that's, of course, Jordan Peterson. Now, Jordan Peterson is saying things <laughs> that two generations ago were just common sense that everybody knew. And today, we've got left libertarians who are appalled by Jordan Peterson and how right-wing he is. He's just saying, be a decent person, try to get your life in order, do sensible common sense things, and oh, this is incredibly right wing. And yeah, okay. It just goes, goes to show how completely out to lunch the left libertarians are. <laughs> this is a professor, he teaches psychology at the University of Toronto after having taught at Harvard. He is the most unlikely hero you can imagine. And he just refused, now he became, um, well known because of the whole transgender pronoun issue, but obviously that issue went well beyond the surface matter of mere pronouns. But on Canadian television, Peterson said, I'm not doing this. 
If they fine me, I won't pay it. If they put me in jail, I'll go on a hunger strike. I'm not doing this. He said those four magic words. I'm not doing this. And suddenly people realized, wait a minute, there's one person who is standing up and saying, nope, I'm not going along and I'm not apologizing because I, unlike you people, have nothing to apologize for. And everybody rallied to him. Now, if the left had any sense, they'd stop attacking him because every time they attack him, he just earns more money. In fact, <laughs> he used these very words on Joe Rogan's podcast, I have figured out how to monetize the social justice warriors. <laughs> he used those exact words. But they can't, they can't help himself. Even though they're just fueling the fire they say they want to extinguish, they keep throwing gas on it. They don't know what else to do. Well, people who admired him just for bucking PC pressure started watching everything of his they could find. And we see countless young men crediting him for helping him find meaning in their lives and getting their lives in order. So again, it takes only one articulate dissident to spark a true liberation movement. And Peterson has been very much that. Now, I just saw footage that was from earlier this year, but I only just saw it, from a Peterson event in Ontario, Canada, at Queen's University earlier this year. And the usual antics went on. Because, I mean, you know that the university system is all about the free exchange of ideas where we politely address each other and see where that takes us. Well, you'll, you'll be surprised to learn that there were students yelling there, holding signs on stage. Uh, one of them was opposed to bigotry. Now, that's a really bold statement. <laughs> I'm against bigotry. What, now, I think one of these days they're going to really come out boldly and say they're also against cancer. <laughs> they really can summon all their strength and courage. So the protesters were finally uh, removed, physically removed. <laughs> And as one shouting protester was escorted out, Peterson told the audience matter-of-factly, that's pure narcissism at work, by the way. And the crowd roared. And the beauty was no one could distinctly make out what the protesters were saying because they didn't have the mic. The only thing they could distinctly hear was Peterson saying, that's pure narcissism at work, by the way. And everyone cheered, and the protesters were helpless. They were being mocked, and there was nothing they could do. And Peterson went on to say, to hijack an event like this, and he said this in an even tone, not even as animated as I am now, to hijack an event like this that other people put time and effort into, and to use the civility of the crowd and the civility of the organizers as an excuse to blatantly yell out your ill-informed opinions is no way to conduct a civil dialogue. It's absolutely appalling. The people who do that should be embarrassed. Of course, they have no capacity for embarrassment, these people, but the audience cheered again. A little later, the savages outside, that's my editorial comment, <laughs> started pounding on the doors and windows and they began chanting, lock them in and burn it down. Another woman who broke a st stained glass window was found to be carrying a garret, which is used to strangle people. These people are not your friends, Peterson said to the crowd. Huge cheer. And then the pounding continues, and he said, that, and mark my words, that's the sound of the barbarians pounding at the gates. So again, he's smashing them left and right. There's nothing they can do. All they have is, uh, uh, and he's articulately smashing them. Beautiful. And he says, that use of inchoate sensation is the best formulation of their argument. And there's not much difference between knocking on the doors and knocking on you. Now, during the entire episode, he remained cool and collected, speaking in an even tone and defying the caricature of him that they were trying to paint. Now, he was the winner of that exchange in every way. Every person who came to see him is now twice as strong a supporter. And he provoked the SJW crowd into revealing its hand. 
even a mild-mannered professor can't be allowed to speak without incident and without intimidation? What normal person is going to side with an angry mob pounding on the building from outside? So again, with Ron Paul and with Jordan Peterson, and as I'll note later, the Mises Institute, what do you have? People who are fearless, who do not care what people who are going to hate their guts no matter what they do say about them. They just carry on promoting the truth. They're not bootlickers. They're not looking for the approval of those in power. They just speak the truth. And look what happens. Ron Paul spoke the truth. Millions of people rallied to him. Jordan Peterson spoke the truth. He now earns over a million dollars a year in donations by people who know he's making a million dollars a year, who maybe earn one-tenth, one-hundredth of that, and they send it to him because they just want him to have it. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for doing this. Now, let me say a little something about Another, let's say, another cultural war we have, and that's against one of the regime's alleged values. The regime says it believes in equality. Ha ha. If it believed in equality, then it wouldn't say that it lives by a separate set of moral rules than the rest of us. But it loves ideas like equality because they can never be attained, and therefore the state can get its tentacles into everything forever because it can never be attained. Even if you could reach absolute material equality, that equilibrium is uprooted the very next moment as soon as people once again begin to enter into voluntary exchanges that rearrange resources. That was Robert Nozick's point. So you have this unattainable goal. That's why the state loves it. That's why the great uh, M.E. Bradford, who was a conservative rather than a libertarian, but, but a man with very great insight, that's why he warned about this concept. I mean, of course, there are, you can think of a way in which the concept of equality could be used sensibly, like equality before the law, but it's almost never used that way. And once you begin using it, there's no way to bottle it. It begins to be perverted for all kinds of bizarre causes. Now, when I pointed this out on my email list, I got, a, I got a criticism. Oh, Woods, you're exaggerating. People who talk about equality, we don't believe in absolute equality. Well, then why are you using the word? What do you mean by equality? Less inequality than we have now? What, what kind of non-rigorous, inane idea is this? <laughs> you, so you don't believe in absolute, then what do you believe? Then don't, if you just want to help the poor, then just say that. What does equality have to do with it if you don't believe in absolute equality? And there are philosophers who call for absolute equality. I'm not making that up. Larry Temkin calls for absolute equality. Michael Otsuka calls for absolute equality. There are such people. Or my friend Jared Casey has this wonderful history of political thought, and in there um, you find reference to the philosopher, who's still with us, uh, Cecile Fabre. And she has a series of papers and books. Uh, her one of them is called Justice, Fairness, and World Ownership. Okay, not quite sure what that means, but okay. Then a book called Whose Body Is It Anyway? Justice and the Integrity of the Person. All right, well, that's starting to sound a little bit ominous. And then her paper, Justice and the Compulsory Taking of Live Body Parts. Hmm. Because after all, after all, if it's true, if, if equality is the mission, then what we very often see is the sort of argument that runs like this. You're not entitled to the things you have. You're not entitled to your attributes. You're not entitled to luck that you may have had. Uh, these things ought to be redistributed. You, know, you, have no you have no moral dessert here. These things just came to you, uh, and, and you may say, but I worked really hard for them. And they'll come back with, but you don't deserve your work ethic either. You know, that's just something that you are just lucky to have. And so... This idea of we have to make everything equal means that, well, you even get to John Rawls, who could barely bring himself to admit that, yeah, okay, I, we can keep the family. I guess we don't really need to abolish the family, even though the family is also a source of inequality. Oh, I'm really relieved at that ringing defense of the family. So there are no institutions that can't be destroyed, uh, perverted in one way or another in the name of implementing so-called equality. 
And they say, you may say, but Woods, I believe in equality of opportunity, not equality of results. That's what a Republican politician will say. That's what I believe in. Okay. Then what they'll say to you is, if we're going to give people equality of opportunity, we have to redistribute wealth. How do you expect a poor child to have equality of opportunity? So try as you might to put a lid on it, equality takes on a life of its own. It was used to justify busing kids 90 minutes each way in order to achieve racial balance in schools. What was the result? The schools became war zones, the students hated each other, the local patriotisms built around local school sy systems atrophied, and eventually even the NAACP declared this to be a stupid and destructive policy that should be immediately discontinued. Now, if you didn't predict that that was precisely what was going to happen, you're probably not entitled to an opinion on any of these issues. Equality has been cited as the reason for throwing out standardized tests. It looks like the LSAT may be next. Or dumbing down civil service exams to the point where everyone scores 100 so they can no longer claim that the tests are discriminatory. The only sense in which equality can be useful is this. Everyone is equally forbidden to initiate physical force against anyone else. And there it is. That's the usefulness of the term. Now, finally, let me say a word about how to carry on these wars where we find ourselves up against everything and everybody, which, by the way, I positively relish and thoroughly enjoy. Uh, and, and by the way, I don't say that in the sense that I want to be gratuitously belligerent and unreasonable and not persuasive. I want to talk to every audience I have in a language they can get so that they come on board with me. I went on a, an evangelical Christian radio show in 2012 to defend Ron Paul against a, a, you know, what was a very unsympathetic audience. And I think by the end, I had made some pretty good inroads there. So I, I, I can do this. But I'm not going to back down. Even if you ask me a tough question, I'm going to give you the honest answer. I don't see what the benefit of, of not doing that is. Well, I want to make reference once again to the example of Ron Paul because of what he teaches us in this, in this respect. How he carried on in those presidential campaigns is highly instructive. There's a fellow out on the West Coast you've never heard of named John Arden. And he was watching in 2007 when that whole exchange with Rudy Giuliani over foreign policy took place. And he said this, Ron Paul, without a friend in the world, nothing but hostility aimed at him from all directions, stood his ground and did not back down, just reiterated his points even stronger. I was blown away. I felt at that moment that the world changed forever, that here had been this massive shift in reality and what could happen. And of course, it wasn't the last such moment. I mean, he goes to Florida, of all places, and says we ought to open up trade with Cuba. He goes to South Carolina and says we ought to end the drug war. Uh, at a speech before an Arab American Association, when they asked him, do you have a special speech prepared for us? Well, every politician has a special speech for every group he speaks to. And Ron Paul said, I have the same speech for you that I deliver to everybody. Who is this man? So why did he do these things? Why didn't he just take the path of least resistance? Just speak in slogans, take no political risks. All right, well, one reason is obvious. He's honest. He's an honest man. But the other reason may not be so obvious, and that is he was seeking out what Albert J. Nock called the remnant. And once in a while, we used to hear Dr. Paul talking about the remnant. And what did he mean by that? He's referring to a famous essay by Albert J. Nock called Isaiah's Job. And in that essay, Nock borrowed the example of the prophet Isaiah to describe the task of the honest man in public life. And now, he adopts the Lord's instructions to Isaiah into a, a modern, uh, adapts them into a modern vernacular, let's say. So this is what he has God saying to uh, Isaiah. Tell them what is wrong and why and what is going to happen unless they have a change of heart and straighten up. Don't mince matters. Make it clear that they are positively down to their last chance. Give it to them good and strong and keep on giving it to them. I suppose perhaps I ought to tell you that it won't do any good. <laughs> the official class and their intelligentsia will turn up their noses at you and the masses will not even listen. They will all keep on in their own ways until they carry everything down to destruction and you will probably be lucky if you get out with your life. Well, then what's the point of doing this? Ah, the Lord said, you do not get the point. There is a remnant there that you know nothing about. They are obscure, 
unorganized, inarticulate, each one rubbing along as best he can. They need to be encouraged and braced up because when everything has gone completely to the dogs, they are the ones who will come back and build up a new society. And meanwhile, your preaching will reassure them and keep them hanging on. Your job is to take care of the remnant. So be off now and set about it. And that's what he was doing. He's looking for this remnant. He's giving them comfort. He's making them aware of themselves. He's providing them a rallying point. If he sold out for the sake of mainstream respectability, he'd defeat that purpose entirely. That kind of approach repels the remnant. But the truth teller who appeals to the remnant will find them. Now, a lot of people, probably the majority, don't want their worldviews challenged. What they want are endless goodies. They want checks with their names on them. They want to be flattered. They want to be told, you are the awesomest of the awesome, and that's why your government is hated around the world, because of your awesomeness. <laughs> now, somebody at that level of moral and intellectual development is not going to understand a Ron Paul, much less support him. And it is frustrating and fruitless to appeal to such people, Knox says. And he says, they ask you to give them what they want. They insist upon it and will take nothing else. And following their whims, their irrational changes of fancy, their hot and cold fits is a tedious business. The remnant, on the other hand, want only the best you have, whatever that may be. Give them that and they are satisfied. You have nothing more to worry about. And what's more, you will repel the remnant if you offer one of these ritual apologies for straying from the three by five card of allowable opinion, you rally them by burning that card because they get a whiff of the smoke and they come running. Now, Ron Paul had so much fundraising success because the remnant had never been deliberately sought out by a presidential candidate before. Here was a man of intelligence who defied all political convention, taught the public about things they didn't even know they should be concerned with, and could boast a record of consistency that impressed even the most hardened cynic. That got their attention. Now, Nock had things mostly right, but I would amend his presentation just a bit. He appeared to speak as if the remnant were a fixed number of people. They might be sought out, but that's it. But Dr. Paul has shown that the remnant can be increased, not just found and inspired. His commitment to the truth, even when it seemed to yield him only grief, seized the attention of a great many apathetic Americans and added them to the ranks of the remnant. Now, Nock described the task of finding the remnant as a largely thankless one, a job for which one would search in vain for tangible results. He said this, in any given society, the remnant are always so largely an unknown quantity you do not know and, never, and will never know who the remnant are, nor what they are doing or will do. Two things you do know and no more. First, that they exist. Second, that they will find you. Except for these two certainties, working for the remnant means working in impenetrable darkness. Now, Nock lived before the internet. Ron Paul now knows who the remnant are. He has a sense of their numbers. He knows some of the things they're doing. He knows he's had an impact. Nock didn't think this was possible. In his, his day, it wasn't. But today, we live at a moment of opportunity we could scarcely have imagined even a generation ago. A revolution in information transmission is underway. Anyone can express his ideas before the world. All of a sudden, ideas, books, and people shunned by the three by five card can get a worldwide hearing, one way or another. Next to this, Gutenberg looks like a lazy bum. <laughs> Ron Paul did his job. He found and built up the remnant. And it's there, rather than in the fleeting passage of legislation, that genuine long-term change will emerge. And this is how the Mises Institute has been proceeding. Seeking out the remnant, not caring about what idiots say, just ignoring all that is so much flotsam and jetsam. Seeking out the remnant by being consistent and fearless. Not clamoring for respectability. Not inviting the Fed chairman to its events. That's your strategy. Good luck. But what we with the Mises Institute are doing, 
are finding and building up the remnant. That's the only strategy that can possibly work. We appeal to people who want the truth told to them, who don't want political correctness, who don't want people who crave mainstream respectability, but who will tell them the truth come what may. And we are not able to carry out that mission without you folks here in this room. And we're deeply grateful for your support. If this sounds to you like something appealing, like something history making, like something that makes good sense, then I urge you to continue your support for the Mises Institute, which I frankly consider to be the most important thing in the world. Thank you very much.